¿Vas a activar el micrófono? Está activo. Muchas gracias. Buenos días a todos. Bienvenidos a esta conferencia Santa Ló, que eh, se produce con un cierto tiempo de, de retraso debido a, a la pandemia. A ver si eh, supone esta conferencia el que volvemos a, a recuperar las, las cosas antes de, antes de, de la pandemia, la normalidad y cada vez más rápidamente y todo lo que hemos tenido que dejar por el camino. Estoy contento eh, de, de, eso, de, de que estés de, de de con él porque no solamente, no solamente eh, tenemos el placer de recibir a la Universidad Pública de Navarra, Navarra para darnos una conferencia, conferencia que yo creo que es realmente interesante y especialmente nos interesa a mucha gente, a mucha gente sino que, sino además, que pues, además, eh, pues, supone que vamos supone, volviendo a la normalidad. Tenemos que ser cautos, que todavía no pegar de no pegar de pero yo creo que afortunadamente la normalidad. Acerca de la nuestra invitada, que haya aceptado, que haya aceptado, que haya aceptado, que que haya aceptado, que haya Hola, buenos días. Hola, buenos días. Muchas gracias. 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 Much Prestigious lecture. Prestigious lecture. Um, um, and together with the story, together with the story of the story of the history of the history, began to, to, began to, to, to publish the, 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 the its issues in its issues in 1988. We are talking already. We are talking already of, of a long, a long history. History. Of the scientific, of the scientific, scientific contribution from this faculty. Um, I'm talking about this because, I'm talking about this, this, is about this, because this is my first lecture, lecture as the editor in chief. And because of that, I think that, that, I, that, I, think that should I should address some words. And I'm sorry, Lola, I'm sorry, I'm going to take just a few minutes. Just a few minutes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hello, <laughs> because I don't know, I feel so excited with, with this, as uh, the dean said before. Uh, of this going back to normal life that I thought that I had to say some extra additional words uh, about the journal and about the lecture. Um, uh, my appointment was, I think, that one year and a half uh, ago, but I didn't have the opportunity of, of having this Santal lecture because this year we all know that, that the situation was not the, the good one to have a, a standard Santalo a conference as in the previous years. I, I was appointed at the beginning of 2020 and at that point I was very worried because, um, I mean, this is a prestigious journal. It was a, a load upon me, and, but at the same time I took it as a challenge because as I thought and finally I realized that it was true, that was going to be very exciting. It's been very exciting and I enjoy my job. And, but at the same time, I know that this is a, a very difficult task, um, mainly because of the high standards of the journal, of the previous uh, editors-in-chief, 
and to whom I'm absolutely indebted and, and to whom I, I want to convey my deepest gratitude. Especially, for example, we have among us Jose Chuarrieta, who was the former editor-in-chief just before me. And Jose Chu, thank you very much because you helped me quite a lot at the beginning of my of my position in the, in this in the journal so thank you very much i wanted to take advantage of this public uh, presentation to to express my gratitude to to you thank you very much jose Cho. okay the quality of this journal is based of course on on the papers on the authors and on the members of the editorial board we have excellent members we have among among us some of the members of our editorial board um, and we have excellent members uh, among the list of uh, associate editors and um, to all of them i have to also express my my deepest gratitude this year there were some changes so i think it's a good opportunity as we are celebrating this non-editorial activity or party of the journal to just say some words of about the the changes in the editorial board so in this last year uh professor bern carl professor hans Trivel, and professor thierry casenab so stepped back uh, from the official list of members of the of this editorial board but never stepped back from the list of people who gave a, a fantastic contribution to the journal and they will be in members of our family forever. I, of course, I, we wrote emails uh, when they decided to, to go back because actually they are retiring from the scientific life. And I, of course, officially sent my, my most sincere uh, gratitude to them. But again, I want to take advantage of, of this public lecture to, to express our uh, to say thank you for all the years uh, they have shared with us, um, for the hard work and excellent scientific contribution to the journal during the years they have been members of the board. At the same time, there are new members. So we have two new members. So we are honored by the acceptance of Lucas Grafakos and Dorothy Haroske as new members of the editorial board. And as the rest of the members, so we are in, uh, in the best hands. So the scientific standards of the journal are going to be with positive derivative for just because, not because of the editor-in-chief, but mainly because of the quality and the prestigious uh, careers of, of these members, together with the new members, we are welcoming now. Okay. And this is... These are the words I wanted to, to say. And now we are going to talk about the lecture of our Santa Law conference. And as the Dean said before, this should have taken place in at the beginning of the of the academic year. So um, first of all, I have to, to thank Lola Ogarte for accepting the invitation of this unusual lecture, unusual in terms of calendar, unusual in terms of physical situation. So uh, we have encouraged people to follow the conference through through the YouTube channel. And we have some members here, but uh, some others will are watching the, the television right now at home, having a second or third breakfast, or there will be the, the video uh, today, tomorrow. These are the advantages of technology. But uh, she accepted this strange invitation, so thank you very much. Uh, Lola Ogarte, um, I have some of your awards and, and positions. I'm going to say something. I'm sure I'm, I will forget many of the, of the important points of your CV, but just to, to give situation of, of the lecture, we are honored today. Um, Lolo Garte studied in, in Zaragoza, if I'm not wrong. Yes. So that's my, where my family comes from. So that mm. makes me very happy. And then you completed your PhD from the University of Pamplona, uh, Universidad Pública de Navarra. Oh. And I think that, that then you spent some time in Canada, in Vancouver, and then you took a position 
now you are a full professor in the Universidad Pública de, de Navarra. And she has been member of different boards and committees, and she's now, or she has been member, for example, of FENSTAT, which is the European Federation of Static Societies. And of course, and probably because of this, many of us know Lola Garte much before we met her uh, physically because of his uh, membership of the board of the Spanish Agency of uh, Research uh, in the section of mathematics in the Agencia Nacional, which is a very important position, by the way, <laughs> or at least many of our decisions depend on the members of this board. Um, she's a specialty, uh, her specialty is about spatial and time spatial distribution um, of statistical nature with uh, applications to many different situations. By the way, today the suggesting title of the talk we are going to share uh, give us a, a bit of the taste of the kind of research you are doing. So we are all looking forward to, to hearing from, from your lecture. I have some data about uh, citations, number of papers. Um, I don't know. Uh, it, they are very impressive. Uh, the contribution in terms of books, papers, um, and as I said before, the citations. And I don't want to bother you with these figures, especially now when we say that these figures are not a representation <laughs> of the quality and so forth. But I'm sure that the quality of our lecture is is underpinned by by just the mere fact that we many of us already know. I am a geometer, so I'm pretty far from from the specialty of research of our lecture, but I already knew that there was some Lola Ugarte in the in Pamplona. So I think that that we know that beyond these impressive numbers, we are talking about a fantastic researcher. Um, and just because of that, we are honored here by your presence and for accepting the invitation of a talk entitled, let me say if I say the title, OK, <laughs> on spatial temporal confounding in aerial models with a data analysis on gender-based violence. And um, as I said before, I'm so excited that I just want to begin the lecture. I stop talking. Um, thank you very much, Lola, uh, for being here. So it's not the first time in this faculty, and I hope it's not going to be the last one. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much first uh, to Marco and also to the Dean of the Faculty of Mathematics. I am very impressed and thank you also for the presentation. Uh, he's telling a little bit of lies, but that's OK. His level of English is much better than mine, so I, I hope that you will understand my talk today. So really, I'm very honored, I'm very pleased, I'm very happy to be here today with all of you. And it's an honor to give this conference, Santa Lu conference, here today. Okay. So uh, Marco asked me to talk about one hour, so um, I, I have to follow the rules. And uh, I try to give ideas more than technical details sometimes, because this is a wide audience. So uh, in order to, at least uh, to follow what, what is my intention here today. Okay. So uh, I'm from the Department of Statistics, Computer Science and Mathematics, and also from the Institute of Advanced Materials and Mathematics at the Public University of Navarre. And uh, currently, I'm the head of the Spatial Statistics Group from the Public University of Navarre. Okay, so today I'm going to talk on, as uh, Marco says, spatial temporal confounding in IAL models with, uh, I would say, uh, an application on gender based violence. Okay? So uh, the, the structure of my talk is the following I'm going to to give uh, an introduction, uh, the, the specific objectives, some uh, introduction on and identifiability and confounding in spatial temporal models. Then a few words on model fitting and inference, how I fit the models I'm going to introduce. Uh, data analysis to see the effect of confounding, and then a little bit of discussion. But before doing that, I'll start defining a little bit spatial statistics data and see where my talk is incarnated in, is in a particular uh, type of spatial data, which is aerial data and also in a particular kind of applications, which is what is called disease mapping. 
disease mapping is important. It's a nice application, the, the main application of ideal data, usually, and a new source of new statistical problems. So I'm very pleased to, to give this talk. So just a, a, a few slides to, for you to get the feeling of this. Those of the audience that, that, that don't know this, many of you perhaps you know, but for the rest of you, spatial data can be classified in one of three basic types. Geostatistical data, aerial data, and point point data. So the statistical data, the spatial process is observed in a few points over a continuous domain. So imagine I'm interested in soil nitrogen concentration in a particular area. So I know that concentration and my interest is in predicting that concentration in new locations. That will be the, just the, the goal of your statistics mainly. Uh, in lattice data, also called aerial data, because the, the, the areas does not need to be uniform, they can be irregular, uh, the spatial domain is partitioned into a finite number of aerial units with well-defined boundaries. For example, I may think on Spain and all its provinces, I might be interested in studying the relative risk of mortality of brain cancer, for example, in each one of those areas. Okay, so what, 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 which objective? With the objective of knowing, for example, where are the hot spots or where there are the regions with low risk. Okay? And in the, in the case of point path data, the locations themselves are of interest. Okay? For example, there are wildfires. I want to see if they are uniformly distributed or whether they're going to be a new one, etc. So my talk today is on this part here. It's, in, it's, it's on aerial data for just to focus a little bit, okay? And on a particular application, which is the most famous one, which is disease mapping, okay? Disease mapping because you usually represent results in maps, okay? So as I'm going to give a little bit of background on disease mapping, very brief. And uh, this disease mapping may be defined, as I said here, as the, as the estimation and representation in a map of certain measures, usually uh, relative risk or race, uh, mortality, incidence, or any other, uh, or any other thing. No? But data are uh, relatively easy to obtain. For example, mortality data are relatively easy to obtain because there are mortality registers all over Spain. And in our case, the uh, Statistical National Office uh, gives the mortality data at, at certain uh, disaggregation levels. For example, uh, provinces or municipalities or even census tracts. Okay, so these data are... Uh, more or less uh, easy to, to take. No? Uh, this this uh, context of a study, this disease mapping, began around 1800, motivated by a desire, as I said, to evaluate mortality geographical patterns. How is the geographical pattern? How it evolves on, in time, etc. And mainly because we, we want, or the interest is in identifying potential risk factors that might be affecting the disease. And why to look into the areas? Because individual factors are not usually enough to, for understanding the etiology of a disease. And it is important uh, to take into account contextual factors of the areas of residence, for example, the pollution in the region, or the diet, or the type of habits of the people. So that's very important. The earliest work in this, in this disease mapping, or at least one of the earliest, it was the, the, the work by Dr. John Snow in 1855, and uh, it's very famous because he was able to map the cholera cases in London. These little uh, black dots are, are the, the cholera cases and was able to determine the risk factor, which was a contaminated water pump on Broad Street. Dr. Snow used the map to convince the local authorities to remove the pump scandal. And this was done and the number of, of uh, cholera cases was dramatically reduced. So it was very interesting. And the interest in mapping infectious diseases such as cholera, influenza or yellow fever continued during the 20th century. Nowadays, we are, we are very much aware of looking at maps of COVID-19, for example, incidence or mortality even. No? And also disease atlases are also very common. I remember not long time ago, that our colleagues from Spain, Martinez Benedito and co-authors, they publish uh, an atlas on, 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 all the, on, on a lot of mortality causes that uh, was published in El País, you might remember. It was not a, not a long time ago. So, of course, currently, the observed cases are not represented in a map. 
because if we have an area with a lot of people, we possibly are going to have more cases there. So we need kind of standardize that, that numbers, right? So sometimes cases per 1,000 inhabitants are computed. Right? And we have seen how many people uh, suffering COVID by 1,000 inhabitants, etc. But one of the most classical statistical measures in the epidemiological literature to analyze incidence of mortality is what is called the standardized mortality ratio or the standardized incidence ratio. And it's simply computed as a ratio of the number, observed number of cases divided by the expected number of cases. And so this measure compares the observed number of cases with the number of cases we would expect in an area if that area had this, the same mortality rate as the whole region. So, in other words, the standardized mortality ratio compares the ith area with the whole region. And if that ratio is greater than one, I am observing more cases that I expected to observe. So I have a high risk region. And the opposite, the other way around. If this ratio is less than one, it means that that region is somehow protected against that, that, that disease. But what happened with this very simple measure? By the way, this is a classical measure, but where it comes from? If we assume that the number of cases in a region follows a Poisson distribution, which means EI, where EI is the, is the expected number of cases, which is usually known, or, or at least considered known, uh, then, the, the, then the, the maximum likelihood estimator of the relative risks is the standardized mortality ratio. So that classical measure is simply a maximum likelihood estimator of a certain parameter in a Poisson distribution. What happened with this measure? The problem that this measure has is that it's very variable, very variable when you have small areas. So it's not good and we need somehow a smooth the risk in the region because otherwise we are seeing a geographical pattern very extreme. We may have very little cases in a very small area and a high risk, then it's not a good measure. So nowadays, we use more sophisticated models to try to stabilize that measure, that relative risk, and represent them later in a map. And we use what are called the hierarchical mixed Poisson models. There are Poisson models that incorporate random effects and, uh, and that's why they, they are called mix in, in the statistics. Any model that has a random effect is usually called a mix model. So this smoothing will permit easy visualization of the underlying geographical pattern of the disease. If I click here, we will see a map. I don't, I'm not sure if to do this now, because, but let's see. For example, it takes a while because I am smoothing here. Mortality by COVID in the first wave but not in Spain, in England. Okay, so this is a work in collaboration with Peter Condon, and where you see the, 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 the red areas is where you have higher mortality risk. Okay, so we usually show this to the people, okay, together with a map that tells me if the high risks are statistically significant or not. Usually in this area, the Bayesian uh, approach is used and then usually we represent what we call the posterior probabilities that the relative risk will be greater than one. Is that probability higher? Then we consider that area as a high risk area. Okay? So let's start now with my talk. Okay? Now that you have an idea of what the disease mapping is and what is the goal in this area, I'm going to talk a little bit about other problems that you might happen when you introduce spatial and temporal random effects in a model, okay? So, of course, this little Poisson model, number of ideas following a Poisson distribution is very restricted, mainly because the Poisson distribution is one that has the same mean and variance, and this usually the variability in the data is much bigger than the mean. So we need to try kind of explaining that extra variability. And that's why we are using this kind of models. And of course, if instead of seeing, or instead of uh, representing only the geographical distribution, we want to see its evolution in time, we need a spatial temporal models. And this is what I'm uh, doing here. So these models are very valuable as they provide information, as I said, on the geographical pattern of the disease and how it evolves uh, with time and where are the regions with extreme risks. So that's very important. No? 
And as I said, all this stuff is usually applied in epidemiology and public health. But recently, we started to try to use these uh, techniques in, in, in another context. And the context is uh, studying uh, crimes, the spatiotemporal patterns of crimes against women, particularly in India. And you will be surprised why I'm going to, to work with India data, Indian data, and this is why, because I was giving a talk in the, in, the, in the Indian Statistical Institute in Kolkata, and there I know a woman and asked me for being involved in this, in this kind of, of stuff, and, and then I did it. So, and why is it important for, for crimes against women? Because the geographic patterns might indicate, for example, the risks intrinsically associated to a region. There, are, there could be, for example, specific traditions or cultural practices that may be exerting some influence on gender-based violence. Global temporal trends gives me information about lots of things. For example, if there, if there have been some policies trying to improve the situation of women, have, have they been useful or not? Then I see the evolution of the, of the risk and I have a look to there. No? And then the space-time interaction, so my model will be divided like in three parts, the spatial pattern, global, the temporal pattern, and then a kind of a specific spatial temporal pattern. How is behaving each region in a certain moment of time, such that it can be, for example, influenced by regional policies rather than national ones. That's the idea. Okay, but okay, this is, if I don't have any explanatory variables for my disease, any covariates, then what I'm doing here is like a first step in developing an understanding of the disease or the crime under study. But what to do if I have some information on variables that might be influence, influencing my, my disease or my crime? Then I want to take them into account and to put them into the model. Uh, and of course, this is what I'm going to do. Before in this area, people say, OK, don't worry. If you don't have explanatory variables, it doesn't matter. Your random effects are going to play that role. But this is not true. And you can try to have a look to this Hodge and Rage 2010 where they, they see that the, the, the random effects do not necessarily substitute any absence of covariates, okay? So here, today, I'm going to work with covariates, okay? So the, 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 the specific area is called ecological spatial regression, ecological spatial regression. And my objective is going to be to quantify the association between the response, my relative risk, and the uh, set of covariates. That's going to be my... And, and what happened? That the presence of spatially correlated random effects can mask or even bias the estimates of the fixed effects, such that the association can be wrongly measured in a, in a way. Okay? So this is what is called a spatial confounding. A spatial confounding occurs when the covariates, my covariates have a spatial pattern. When I represent them in a map, I saw clearly a spatial pattern, and they are collinear with the spatial random effects. And then I do have a problem, and the estimate of my fixed effects can be affected. It can have bias, or it can inflate variance, or even it can be, it can pass from being non-statistically significant or being statistically significant to non-statistically significant, which then I'm going to say wrong things about my disease. Okay. Okay. Uh, here, the the first work. Uh, about all this stuff was done by Rach and co-authors. And what they, they, they saw with, when, when, what, what they saw is they introduced a spatial random effect, which is a random effect that takes into account the, the, the neighboring regions of my region of interest. And they model it as a conditional autoregressive uh, prior or as a conditional autoregressive distribution. And they saw, analyzing a particular data set, that when they did not include the, the car effect, it was a relationship between stomach cancer data and a certain socioeconomic uh, deprivation index. Huh? But when they introduce the random effect, that effect disappears, and they wonder why. So it's, 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 like, the, it's like the explanatory variable and the, and the random effects are trying to explain the same variability, and they fight each other. And we don't want that. We want the, the, the explanatory variable to see its effect alone, in a way. Okay, so. This happened in a, spatial in a spatial context. What happened in a spatial temporal context? 
that the temporal dimension may emerge as a new source of confounding. And then the problem might be even worse. Okay? So here, in my particular application, I have a covariate which varies spatiotemporally. So I might have a spatial confounding, temporal confounding, and spatial temporal confounding. Okay? And I'm going to propose methods to deal with confounding, but also with model identifiability. Okay? Why? Because I want to identify the, the, the spatial effect, the temporal effect, and the spatiotemporal effect, because I might interpret themes with that, as I explained in my previous slide. Okay? So, particular objectives of this talk after this introduction are how to deal with spatiotemporal confounding, and at the same time, taking into account that I want a model that is identifiable. And then I will use the techniques I will present to assess the association between certain socio-demographic covariates and dowry death. What is dowry death? It's a form of crime very specific to India that I will explain later. I want to do this avoiding spatial temporal confounding, but also obtaining good model predictions because I want to predict my relative risk as best as possible. Okay, how to deal with confounding? Okay, there's, a, there's some word in, 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 the, in the spatial uh, context, which is called spa uh, restricted spatial regression. I'm going to see how, if I can extend somehow this to the spatial temporal context. And the second method I'm going to use is, I will examine the use of orthogonality constraints to deal also with both identifiability issues and confounding issues. And we are going to see today that while both methods solve the confounding issue, they will lead to very different results. And at the beginning, we didn't know why, because we thought they were both equivalent. So here, I'll try to disentangle why this happens. Okay, to make it clear, these model identifiability issues arise because the spatial and temporal random effect implicitly include an intercept. And I will show you why. And also because the interaction term and the main effect overlap. Okay? Confounding issues for me arise from collinearity between fixed and random effects, which may lead, as I said, to bias and variance inflation of the fixed effects. So at the end, with inference that is not right. Okay, let's introduce now my model. Uh, I'm going to introduce the, the idea of identifiability first in the spatial case, and then I will move to the spatial temporal. Okay? So, uh, suppose the area under study, for example, Spain, is divided into provinces, into small areas that I will denote by little i. And that OI, cap OI, stands for the number of observed cases in the eighth area. So, conditional on the relative risk, I'm going to assume that the number of cases are distributed as upwards on distribution with mean EI times RI. Now you know what EI are, what, what EI is. It's something that I will consider an upset in my model. Okay, so I apply the logarithm and then I model the log of the relative risks as a global intercept plus a, combina a linear combination of random, of, of explanatory variables plus a, a spatial random effect. And what is the spatial random effect? I'm going to consider here an intrinsic conditional autoregressive distribution in the sense of Bessac, sorry, 1974. And what does it mean? It means that the space, the, the, the effect of the eighth area, here is where I introduce a spatial dependence. The, the, the random effect of the eighth area, conditioning on the neighboring areas, usually adjacent areas, is going to follow a normal distribution with mean, the, mean, the, the mean effect of the surrounding areas. So that's, that's the way of introducing a spatial dependence in my model. And then the, the variance, is inversely proportional to the number of neighbors. Okay? So it can be seen that from this uh, whole set of conditionals, you can arrive, this is a paper in Biometrica, by the way, the vector of, of, uh, of a spatial effect follow an improper distribution with this Gaussian kernel, with Q is the S by S spatial neighborhood matrix. Okay? So from here, you can end up in a joint distribution and this matrix is simply a matrix where the diagonal is the number of neighbors and the off diagonal is minus one uh, if, if the regions are neighbors, are, are neighbors and zero otherwise. 
So uh, this, I think that with the full condition, as you get the idea that I am borrowing information from the surrounding areas. And here you see where it converts lately into a kind of uh, neighborhood matrix, okay? If I use the spectral decomposition of the precision matrix or this matrix Q, sometimes uh, I may use uh, a structure matrix, then, you, that, then it's easy to reveal the identifiability issue. And we did this in a paper of our group in 2018. So this is, we use the following spectral decomposition. So U, sigma, U transpose, where the, 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 the matrix U is a matrix whose, whose uh, columns are the eigenvalues, okay, the, uh, uh, corresponding to the non-null eigenvectors. Okay, so well, here. Here, it, co is, is, it is the, the, the uh, eigenvector corresponding to the null eigenvalue because that matrix has a null eigenvalue and then the rest of eigenvalues are not null. So I split my matrix in two parts. Okay, and of course, U is an orthogonal matrix. Okay, and here the identifiability is used revealed as the, the, this vector here is the vector of, it's a unity vector divided by a normalizing constant. So if we reparameterize the model, it's not difficult, so we may think in multiplying this by u, u transpose, which is the identity because the matrix is orthogonal, then you end up with this reparameterization here. I'm expressing here the model now in matrix form. And then you see that I do have two intercepts in my model, and then I will get rid of one of them. Okay, so then removing the redundant intercept, I arrive to this linear predictor. And the identifiability issue is resolved. Okay, and uh, do, uh, making this zero is the same as imposing a sum to zero constraint on, on the random effect. Okay, so in this way, I might identify my model. But still, I have the problem of a spatial confounding. Okay, so I, I want to see how I can solve the, the spatial confounding problem. And one possible solution, as I said, is restricted regression. And which is the idea? The idea is to retain in the model only the part of the random effects lying in the space orthogonal to the fixed effect. This is what I want to do. Okay? And I'm assuming, I'm assuming that all the competing explanatory effect is assigned to the covariate, and the random effects are simply conceived as smoothing devices. Okay? This is what I'm going to do. So basically, suppose I am in the Gaussian case, my response is Gaussian, normal, and then I have this model. Then what I do is I pre-multiply the random effects by L, L transpose if I do not reparameterize the model first, or I pre-multiply U psi R alpha psi by this uh, L, L transpose. What is L? The colors of L are eigenvectors, having eigenvalue one, of the projection matrix that is projecting, as you see, on the orthogonal space of the fixed effect. Okay? And this is what I'm doing. Uh, uh, in this in this case here, okay. Uh, why they have eigenvalue one? Because it's a projection matrix, right? And projection matrices only have eigenvalues zero or one. So these are the non-zero eigenvalues. So I'm projecting the random effects in a space which is orthogonal to the space spanned by the fixed effects. Okay. So this is linear algebra. I, I quite like it. Uh, with Poisson data, the method requires an adjustment. Okay, because you need to pre-multiply by this matrix here and this post multiply LL transpose by, by another matrix where W is simply the diagonal matrix of weights with diagonal elements this, which is the, the matrix of the iteratively reweighted least square algorithm, for example. No? Okay. And now this W needs to be taken into account because kind of with the Poisson case, I kind of need to linearize my response in order to mimic the normal case in a way. So that's why these W's matrices appear. And now L is the matrix whose columns are the eigenvectors with one eigenvalues of the orthogonal projection matrix, which projects onto the space orthogonal to the scale fixed effect. Okay, so the idea I think is clear. I want to project my random effects in a space orthogonal to the fixed effects. And in the normal cases, uh, standard, let's say, in the Poisson case, you need to adjust a little bit that. Okay, uh, of course, I may uh, get rid of the identifiability issues first and then uh, try to solve the, the confounding pre-multiplying by all this stuff here. 
I know that this is the more technical part of the of the talk, but uh, we are mathematicians, so I decided to preserve a little bit of this. Okay. So what happened now in the spatiotemporal case? Now I go to the spatiotemporal case. Now what I do have is I have uh, data for several years, for, for several time periods. And then conditional on the relative risk IIT, where I stands for region and T for, for period, the number of cases is assumed to be Poisson distributed. I may calculate the, the expected number of cases, consider them as an offset in my model, and then the log risk is modeled like this. Now it's more complex. I have the spatial random effect, the temporal random effect, and the spatial temporal random effect, because there would be interactions be between the space and the time. In, in matrix form, I have to remember all these chronicle products. Uh, it can be written, sorry, it can be written like this. Okay, simply this is the vector of unities of dimension TS, and this is the vector of unities of dimension TA, the, the, the identity matrix, etc. Okay, so simply you write all these equations for I and T, taking a little bit of curve, and then you end up with that uh, matrix form of the model. Okay, again I consider an intrinsic conditional autoregressive prior for the space. Then I give a first order random walk prior for the time. This is fairly standard in the idea. You can have a random walk two or any other kind of autoregressive uh, model, etc. But I use that. And for the spatiotemporal random effect, I'm assuming a distribution with this Gaussian kernel, with now my structure matrix, is the Kronecker product of the structure matrix for the space, uh, for the time, and the, sp space, uh, the, the structure matrix for the space. And this is what is called the type 4 interaction introduced by Hell, but I'm not going to discuss that. This is the most complicated case in, 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 if I choose different kind of spatiotemporal interactions in the, in the, in the sense of, of North Health and Cothos. So uh, if I consider the spectral decomposition of the precision matrices similar to the spatial case, but instead of decomposing just the matrix of the spatial effect, I decompose the matrix of the temporal and the matrix of the spatial temporal, I can see easily all my identifiability problems because I get an intercept here, one intercept that comes from the spatial effect, another intercept that comes from the temporal effect, another one that stands from the, for the spatial temporal, so I have lots of intercepts, and then this term here is repeated here, this term here is repeated here, so I have lots of collinearities. I need to get rid of that. I need to delete those superfluous uh, terms, and then I arrive, after some algebra, I arrive to this model here, we, where all identifiability issues have been sorted out. Okay, so we did this in, in this paper, but uh, now I wanted to, to comment on that. But now, again, I solve the identifiability issues in my spatiotemporal model. Now I need to solve my confounding issues, my potential confounding issues. So what I did, uh, I, I'm going to, 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 to see this in a, in a minute. As I said, in this case, uh, the confounding issues are more challenging, and we are going to see how to solve that. Again, we may start with the reparameterized spatiotemporal models, model where all the identifiability issues have been solved, and then start to see how I solve the confounding issues there. So what I'm going to do now is, again, I will consider the matrix cell whose columns are the eigenvectors having an eigenvalue 1 of this projection matrix, which projects, again, onto the space orthogonal to the scale fixed effect, which is this. Okay? So, and now I consider the matrix K whose columns are eigenvectors, but this time with eigenvalue 0 of this projection matrix. And it can be easily seen, even by construction, that K is in the span of the scale fixed effect, okay? And then I can write my model in matrix form like this. This sum here is the identity, okay? And if I multiply, sorry, this by this, again, I have the identity. So in a sense, I'm pre-multiplying by some terms that are uh, the identity, but now I know that all the terms that involve K are in the span of the scale fixed effect. So I'm going to get rid of those and then arrive to this model here, okay? So by removing the part of the random effects 
that are in the span of the fixed effects, I obtain model three where identifiability issues as well as confounding issues have been sorted out. Okay? And it, as I said here, it might, be, it might be not necessary to orthogonalize all the terms. Perhaps, perhaps my confounding is only spatial, only temporal, only spatial temporal, spatial and temporal, whatever. This is the more general case. Uh, okay, but still we thought in another way of trying to deal with, with confounding, which is called the constraints approach. Okay, the constraints approach. So let's consider this model. And then consider this linear predictor, which are just pre-multiplying by the square root of W, and W, I explained to you what it was before. So to make the random effect orthogonal to the fixed effect, I just take the matrix of uh, fixed effects and the transpose of that, multiply by the vector of random effects, and this needs to be zero. So I do this for the three terms, and I obtain these this, uh, constraints here, okay, which are weighted sums of the spatial effects, including the cobalt sometimes, etc. We saw that doing this is still the term, the interaction term overlaps with the spatial and temporal main random effects, and this, these additional constraints are required. Okay? So we did so using constraints, thinking that both procedures were equivalent, but they were not. They were not. Why we thought they were equivalent? Because when I told you in that model that K was involved. I told you, K is in the, in the span of the fixed effects. I'm going to get rid of those terms. When I do that, it happened that they, these equations match the previous constraints. So we thought the methods were equivalent. But we prove at the end that placing constraints is in fact equivalent not to an orthogonal projection, but to an oblique projection of the random effects, where the projection is this P here, and okay, I'm not going to go into this, but here you have the L matrices and also the B matrices go there. We need a little bit of, of algebra here, and we have, a, if somebody is interested, I can explain this more later. This was the most technical part, so uh, okay, now we can go a little bit to discuss how I can fit those models, with which techniques I can fit those models, and I will go into the data analysis, okay? So what I did is, I have a spatiotemporal random effect, which includes covariate, and then I know that there may be some collinearity between the fixed terms and the random effect. And then I presented two methods to deal with that. But not only that, I also took into account the identifiability problems, because I saw that when I introduce uh, random effects, some terms are somehow implicit there, and when you do this reparametrization of the model, then you, you see that clearly, and then you need to, to get rid of those. Okay, so this is what I did, and then I saw that I have two methods for confounding, one for identifiability, let's say, and then now I want to, I want to fit those models in practice and see uh, what, what, what I'm seeing, okay? So in, in, in disease mapping, there are two methods. You can do all the stuff in a Bayesian context, which is the most typical one, and, oh, you can do this in a frequent test. And I will do both here, okay? So in the, in the Bayesian context, I'm going to use a fairly new technique, which is a kind of uh, Laplace approximation, okay? But this is, is, is uh, nested, Laplace approximation. You apply the Laplace approximation many times in the procedure. And also in the classical approach, also called empirical-based approach, because when you have random effect, you usually call empirical-based approach, okay? You don't give any distribution to the variance component, that's why it's empirical-based or classical, and I, I'm going to use penalized quasi-likelihood. Why? Because, it, because I used it in the past, and I noticed that it's relatively simple and has few convergence problems. So uh, the problem with PQL, and this was another, another tough uh, problem in our, in our research, was that PQL automatically places some to zero constraints due to the random efficiency of the random effects covariance matrices. And then trying to change those uh, constraints to a new one is difficult. And then we did so, okay? So we modified the algorithm to replace this sum to zero identifiability constraints with new constraints that identify the model 
and also solve the desired orthogonality. So we were able to compute the covariance of the random effects given certain constraints that fulfill uh, all the all the all the desired orthogonality and the and, and identify the model. Okay, so it was not easy at all to do this, and we have an appendix proving this, etc. Okay, how about the other the other approach, the the the, the Bayesian approach? So uh, usually these models were solved using Markov chain Monte Carlo techniques, but we noticed from the very beginning that they were very slow. We need days for arriving to a solution. So when this technique was published in Roger B, this paper by Havar Ru and co-authors, by the way, Havar now is in Kausk, but he comes from Norway, uh, we started to use the technique. And it's interesting because my colleagues think that INLA is like a software where you put some data and then you get some results, but that's not true. Because when you have models that are not implemented in the, in the software, you need to do a lot of extra programming, and this is the case here. Okay, so uh, main advantages, as I said, it provides approximate Bayesian inference without relying on lots of simulations like my Cochin Monte Carlo techniques and thus reduce computational cost. It's easy to use with R, which is a free software, etc. And the other uh, nice feature that does not have, for example, a new technique which is Nimble that are developing in the United States recently, is that imposing constraints is relatively simple. Again, relatively simple, okay? So these are the two methods I'm going to use when I present results, using uh, Bayesian in classical way. And now I go into the example, okay? Uh, are you tired? I am a bit... Uh, <laughs> I continue, I might continue for hours. I know that I am in the, in the YouTube, but that's not a problem for me, okay? <laughs> We need to relax a little bit. So we, no, we now go to the, to the example. It's interesting, okay? Uh, I, well, we all know about all the problems in India, right? When uh, I remember uh, when a woman was in a bus, in a public bus, uh, was raped, and it was in all the newspapers around the world. So re really, India has uh, awful problems. We, have, we also have problems, but the dimension of the problem is not comparable even, but uh, we'll see. Okay, so this gender-based violence is currently considered as a public health problem of endemic proportions by the whole World Health Organization. Okay, uh, as I said here, like in India, pues, uh, the patriarchal nature of the state produces gender inequality, which contributes to increasing violence against women. And India is a paradigmatic case. One of the crimes that does not occur in developed countries, but does occur in India, is dowry death. I also know that there are some African countries where this dowry death problem also occurs. Uh, it, it, two years ago, in, in the Spanish newspaper El País, the 10th of October, on occasion of the celebration of the International Day of the Girl, but that, by the way, is the 11th of October, uh, it was a piece of news saying, this was the title, she was a girl. She was buried alive at birth. And the, you can uh, look into internet and look for the, I can click here, but I'm not going to do that because then I talk too much. But uh, in the paper, in the, in, the, in the piece of news, they say that India is the most dangerous country in the world for, for women, ranking first in terms of risk of sexual violence and harassment against women. And one important note is the country has 63 million fewer women that it should have. Because being born a woman is seen as a family burden. Mm, the majority of them leave home very early to get married. Previous payment of the dowry, okay? And then they become the maid of the parents-in-law, okay? So what is, the, what is the dowry? Muerte por dote in Spanish, okay? Dowry death, muerte por dote. The dowry can be defined as the amount of money, property or goods that the bride's family gives to the groom of his relatives for the marriage. And even if it is prohibited in the Indian Penal Code, it is still a widespread practice in India. Okay? It's the country with the largest number of dowry deaths in the world, more than 8,000 in 2014. So a really terrible problem. Okay? So this dowry system, is related to discrimination against women, leading to female infanticide, and 
that like the news in the El País, and sex-selective abortion, preventing female birth. Okay? And this problem does not stop in the marriage. Sometimes, uh, as we cite, as I say here, committed by a woman who has suffered mental or physical violence in relation to the dowry, is also regarded as a dowry death. Uh, the most common forms are burning, drowning, and poisoning the bride, because they can be easily considered as accident. Okay? But they count them as a dowry death. And this is the crime against women I was interested in. Okay? So here, I will focus on Uttar Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh is, is the most populous state in India. You may know that Agra, for example, and Varanasi are in Uttar Pradesh. It's in the north of the country. I will show a map in a minute. I have data on dowry deaths in 70 districts during the period 2001-2014. You have the map of India here. There it is Uttar Pradesh. And these are the small areas for me, OK? The small areas. Uh, to tell you the truth, the data was obtained by my colleague, Indian colleague. In, he was an Indian student, an English, an Indian PhD student. In fact, that sent the data to me. But I found lots of problems with the data, so I went to the original source, which was this Indian National Crimes Bureau. Uh, and you can find data, this data in internet. Okay. So, for example, according to just to have an idea, to the census of 2011. The total population was about 200 people, female, 95 million. And we focus on women between 15 and 49 years of age. This was also, I choose that age because I discussed with her. And it seems that also quite all women are also married and suffering this problem. So this is about 47 million women. And in 2014, the last year of the study period, dowry deaths in Uttar Pradesh were about almost 30 percent of all dowry deaths in India. Okay, so a, a really big problem. Now, uh, of course, one of the difficulties of combating this crime is many times the lack of knowledge about potential risk factors that might be associated with dowry deaths. And then we try to get some of them and see if we find them are significant or not. And uh, this, we, we, we were able to have some district level covariates like sex ratio. Sex ratio is defined in a different way in other countries, but in India is the number of females per 1,000 men, males, and then population density, female literacy rate, per capita income, and then other crimes like murder rate and burglary rate. And now, okay, I do have those uh, data, and then I want to consider two different spatial, spatial temporal models to analyze this data. The first one is just a simple Poisson model incorporating all the explanatory variables, but no random effects. I'm going to see that this model is so full because it does not fit the data well. And then the classical model, a spatial temporal model that does not account for confounding. And we are going to see what, what, what happened with the fixed effects estimates. And then our first procedure to to deal with uh, confounding, which is restricted regression. And then the second procedure we introduced, which is using orthogonality constraints. So a very simple model, the classical model that does not take confounding into account, and then the two models that we, the two techniques that we introduce. And I'm, uh, well, I'm not going to comment on the full Bayesian stuff, but if somebody is interested, I might give you all the the, the, run, the prior distributions I'm using, and also the sensitivity analysis that I did in order to be robust again the specification of the hyper prior distributions. And here I have the result. So in this first part here, I get the inla result. So this is my posterior mean, posterior standard deviation, and these columns here is the my 95% credible interval, and the corresponding information but with penalized quasi likelihood the the mean estimate the standard error and then a 95 percent confidence interval and what we see is this is the usual model without taking into account any any confounding and if you look at the estimate the estimate is very different and the variance is a lot bigger okay so i'm considering this sex ratio statistically significant using the rest of the procedure, but not this procedure. Well, PQL barely excludes zero, no? So there might be some 
little but barely is crucial. And in the rest of the of the variable, it happened more or less the same. Here the effect is negative, but it, it seems to be biased, or at least it's very different from the rest of the procedures. We see that the variance is much greater. It does not make any sense to have this estimate and then this standard error, right? Or this this uh, posterior standard deviation. Results are very similar between inland PQL. With female literacy rate, the, the, the results are striking. The effect is negative, although not significant. And look at the rest of the models. And it happened, oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. So in, in the only uh, two explanatory variables that the fixed effect is estimated very similarly is in Marder and Bangladesh rate. Although, again, if you look at the uh, standard deviations, uh, they are very big compared to the rest of the procedure. So something is happening there. And now I want to see how the model fit, fit my data. And I'm going to use uh, two model selection criteria, one for uh, the Bayesian models and one for the frequentist models. So I'm going to use the deviance information criteria and the archaic information criteria. For those of you that are not statisticians and are not too much used to this, this is the mean deviance. Here is the deviance, this is the posterior mean deviance, it's a measure of model fit. And this is the number of effective parameters, which is a measure of model complexity. So my, my criteria somehow make a trade-off between fitting and complexity. Okay? And what we have seen here is that uh, my model, where I introduce constraint, is giving a mark, of course, the model with only only explanatory variables and no any random effect gives me a poor fit, as I expected, because I'm sure I have over dispersion and spatial variability in the residual, for sure. But you see that the classical model and the model with restricted regression are giving me the same fit, and my last procedure is giving me worse fit. Okay, then uh, we are going to see what is happening here. Same results in ILA and PQL, which, which makes me feeling well, okay, because I'm using very different uh, tri uh, procedures. And here, this is the spatial pattern with model ST2, which is pretty similar to model ST3. These are, by the way, posterior, uh, posterior patterns. I'm not going to go into that now, but uh, these are posterior patterns. And my model 4, the one that where I force the, the, the orthogonality between the fixed and random effect is giving me problems, fitting problems. This is the, the global temporal trend, and it should follow the black line, and it does not. So I'm having problems there. So my model, ST4, I'm seeing clearly that it fits worse. Okay, And uh, we are going to explain why. No? So in terms of model fit, no substantial change in relation to the classical model without dealing with confounding. Why? Because, in fact, model ST3, the one with restricted regression, is simply discarding redundant information. Okay? That part of the fixed effects, okay, they, they just simply explain what is not explained by the fixed effects. And why do models ST3 and ST4 fit so differently? Because we have seen that model ST4, in fact, introduces changes in the model by forcing the random effect to be orthogonal to the fixed effects. And we saw that this is equivalent to an oblique projection onto the orthogonal subspace of the fixed effects, unlike model ST3, where the projection was orthogonal. And because the orthogonal projection minimizes the distance between the original random effects and the projection, this could explain within the improvements in fit over the oblique projection. Okay, so that makes sense for us. Okay, now let's go to the discussion. We are finishing. So what we have seen is the, 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 the data tables uh, clearly reveal the problems that confounding may cause in the estimation of the fixed effects and its standard error or its variance. And of course, this is very important. In my objective is to a study or to estimate associations between the relative risk and the and the fixed effect. Okay, so that's a, that could be a important problem. We have seen uh, that restricted regression and orthogonal constraints both alleviate confounding and provide rather similar estimates of fixed and their standard fixed effects and their standard errors. We have seen those in the table, but in terms of model fit, 
the ST4 model is so for. For practitioners, I may say them that if the relative risks are of primary interest and not the association between the explanatory and the response, then you are doing good with the traditional model, no problem, because you are, you are obtaining a good model fitting. The, 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 the thing is, if you are interested in the association between the fix and the random effect, that the, you, you possibly need to, to, to take account of the, of the confounding issues. Identifiability and confounding issues. And by the way, the traditional model with the right identifiability issues, because we have so many pa papers published that they don't put the right constraints for a proper model identifiability. Okay, that is also important to point out. Okay, so ignoring confounding may match the association between dowry deaths and some risk factors. As I said here, which my obscure understanding of this atrocious practice that takes lives of thousands of women in India. And what we have seen here, we saw that sex ratio was the variable with a more pronounced negative effect. Uh, my covariates, by the way, are standardized, so I may compare the effect. So my sex ratio was the variable with a more pronounced negative effect, meaning possibly that when the number of women per 1,000 men decreases, then the relative risk of, of, of dying by dowry death increases. Okay? And uh, we have also seen that this did with a high rate of other crimes also have, uh, also are showing high rates of dowry death. We have seen that this did with high per capita income, so less risk of dowry deaths, and we also saw a positive association with population density and female literacy rate. And I put here a little sentence where we have in our GitHub the code to reproduce all the analysis. Okay? So if you go here, and you go to the code, okay? You can reproduce the whole thing, okay? Even the even the tables, etc. Everything. So, further research and open questions. I have to tell you that this is a very active area of research. This um, confounding. There have been a couple of papers, one in Jasek and in Calder, and another one recently accepted in Biometrics. And the references there in that I didn't comment along the. the along my, my talk. So I think that this matter is not completely close yet. Very different ideas around. And I have to say that papers on causal inference are also very important uh, to clearly define what people un uh, understand by confounding, etc. So it's a very uh, important topic. And also, you might think that it's an important topic, for example, in other context. For example, with the COVID-19 is one of them. I saw many papers published during this pandemic that ignore confounding issues. So if you want to see which are the explanatory, the covariates that are influencing the COVID-19 mortality. Well, and people are introducing sometimes effects of the region and so on. And then I, I didn't believe those results. And I think that this is still open and a lot of research needs to be done. Okay? So, Yes, I want to finish giving my thanks to all my group, all the members of the Spatial Statistics Group of the Public University of Navarre. But in this particular talk, I have to give my special thanks to Aritz and Thomas, that were co-authors, because, well, somehow I'm using three different papers here in my, in my conference today. Gonzalo, who is, who is now with us, but is from the University of Cuyo. Jim Hodge from the University of Minnesota, who is the father of the restricted regression, and we have collaborated with him this last year. Patrick Snell from the Ohio State University, and Amita Purani, who is the girl that brought to my attention this problem of crimes against women in India. So, uh, you want to see a little bit of my group? I love all of them. It is not too much updated, but this is Gonzalo, Tomas, Arit, this is Anna, who was my supervisor before, and the rest of the members. And there are some, some missing, uh, missing colleagues that are not here. We need to update a little bit, a little bit, uh, a little bit this. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. And you can send me, apart from the talk today, any comments to my particular email. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Lola. I'm impressed. So, um, as you said before, here we, we had your email address, yes, but email if address. there is any question here, I know we have the possibility of receiving questions from, from YouTube. So, if, actually, I'm not very used to this method. So, uh, Raquel, if you help me, I don't know if I will read the questions, if any, uh, as soon as they come. But, okay. Um, so that means that if anyone here, anyone connected uh, through the channel wants to ask anything, so feel free to do it, and I will try to do my best in reading the question, either in Spanish or in English. And at the same time, if anyone here wants to ask <laughs> anything or make a remark, or Eva, please. By the way, I don't know if for that may, may I borrow your your mic. Sure. You can sit down here, perhaps, or your microphone is not working. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, it's because of you. You can come here if you want. I don't know. No? Okay. Okay, so okay. It receives the sounds from everyone. Okay. So, you see, the technology is... Uh... Okay. Okay. I was wondering uh, if you have... Uh, okay, this is linear algebra, so you have finite dimensional matrices. Yes. And I was wondering what happens if you have any sort of uh, wow, which point n goes to infinity? Because I would be interested in yeah. 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 dimensional understanding. Understand. I don't need even to go to infinity but I might have a problem where the number of small areas is very big for example and then of course uh, for fitting the model you have to invert certain matrices which are very big and this is always a bottleneck right so what we are doing right now is we are um, kind of partitioning of our domain in different parts and because we, are, we, we have done this in the spatial case and because we are borrowing information locally we are seeing that partition in the model, the, 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 what is called the divide and conquer strategy, is very good for this problem. Okay? Because then you can partition the problem and analyze in each of those partitions. And what we are doing is we are taking into account also the border effect. So we are considering partitions where they, they are disjoint at the beginning, and then we are introducing first order neighbors, second order neighbors, and so on. This is very easy to do if you don't have explanatory random variables. But when you have uh, explanatory random variables, the first question is, should we suppose that the effect of the, of the covariate, random variable, no, covariate, I wanted to say, should we assume that the effect of the covariate is the same in the whole domain? Because when I partition, I have to be able to estimate a single beta, let's say, no? And then I can use something that is called consensus Monte Carlo, and we are working with that. But I still think that perhaps the effect of a covariate, perhaps, does not need to be the same in the whole domain. And uh, of course, there are uh, random coefficient models and so on in the statistics, no? But we need to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But why do you have been the repetition and then you analyze? And we have seen that the results are very sensible. And we are not doing that. But the question is good. Thank you. Beautiful. So, any other question? I would like, uh, yeah, Antonio, please. First of all, for the very nice talk, and congratulations for the work, which is very interesting and I think very important. I have only a question, and probably it's my fault or my fault, no? But uh, when you consider randomness, you consider two times of the sources of randomness. So one is spatial temporal, one is temporal, and one uh, spatial. Temporal and spatial. The kind of uh, the, the source of the spatial or randomness of from the spatial randomness is quenched. Uh, is what? Quenched. It is fixed for all. In any case, uh, well, each area uh, you take into account the surrounding. Into account the surrounding areas, and this is how it is defined in each area. Okay, so if I am in Navarra, I am a neighbor of Alaba, La Rioja, and, uh, and Aragon, for example, or Huesca. If I am in Madrid, my neighbors will be I don't know Guadalajara, pa 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 pa, pa. That, like that, like that. So I'm using adjacency. By the way, I could use another type of neighborhood. 
If I'm thinking that, I don't know, there is a river that is polluted and then I want to make neighbors other areas, but then I should do that with her, no? Because my, my matrices need to be well defined. But this uh, is a good point also. I would like to ask you something closer to geometry. Oh, <laughs> so then, then I will die. No, 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 <laughs> nothing, nothing serious. Actually, uh, since the beginning, when you were describing the method of orthogonality, orthogonality, the projection. Yes, yes. So I wonder, so perhaps, I mean, other projection could be useful. I mean, you can take like a degree of freedom with respect to the angle of the projection. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned that, that the... Yeah, yeah. My second projection was oblique. E e exactly. So... To me, oblique means that it's not orthogonal. It's, it's not orthogonal, okay. right? That P is so, different from P, tra P transpose, e for Exactly. Example. So how it works. So can you begin with that method and consider this extra degree of freedom and then you can, I don't know, um, guess how this this degree of freedom is going to be to adjust the the the, the I don't okay, know. I understand. The I understand. But you see, I think that any projection that is not going to be orthogonal is going to be worse in terms of model fit, just okay. because how the model the model fit criteria are defined. Okay, they are based somehow on least square, which is a orthogonal projection, and then you are going to get better fit doing that. So if, if you think in oblique projections, you probably need to change also the, 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 the model fitting criteria and things in another kind of stuff, right? Wow. But right now, with all, with all our model selection criteria and so on, ortho orthogonal projections are going to be bad. Okay. Are going to behave better in terms of model fit. And for us, model fit is important. But this is a, a good idea. Because actually, with this orthogonality, you are somehow like minimizing distances or i think i would say so in, in because my deviance somehow is a kind of least square procedure right, right. yes right. yes but this is a nice idea and uh, it took it took us a while to prove that the second method was not uh, equal to the first and uh, it took us a while to prove that it was an orthogonal projection of certain matrices don't think it was easy <sighs> patrick mm, so. uh, patrick uh, snell one of the co-authors is very good on that, and we were discussing that when he was visiting us, and it, it took, uh, it's difficult. I guess so. Lots of algebra. By the way, I love an, uh, 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 Gilbert Strang. You know Gilbert Strang? Do, uh, there is somebody here, yeah. Uh, I, I listen to his classes. Uh, it's very nice, right? <laughs> that you have this in internet, and then uh, to remember all the algebra classes and methods and so on, because sometimes <laughs> we mathematicians study algebra and then you, you, we, we are not connected with real problems and then, oh, it's, a, it's always a, a problem. I need that we need to change our teaching and try to get more related to reality, by the way, and uh, in our faculties and so on, because uh, <laughs> I suffered a crisis after finishing mathematics because of that, too theoretical, everything in the career, nor in my secondary degree, my prof is here and I love her, but uh, yes, but uh, later, uh, yes, I suffered that crisis and then I started to to study some philosophy and things like that because uh, too much theory without you no know, connections with reality. That's why uh, when I returned to mathematics, I decided to go to a more applied area. I feel more comfortable. But that's my case. It's not no, the no, case of I, other actually, people. Actually, I, I share that experience <laughs> with you. Um, and actually, my first, I think that I remember, I'm, I don't know if this is the place, but my first progression line, uh, <laughs> I did it like five years later when I was studying physics in, in, in the building in front of us, uh, not in this in this school, because okay. I uh, uh, studied all the theory of regression, but I not did compute a real uh, <laughs> regression line with, mm -hmm. with real data. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, that's course. necessary. And that's necessary, mm -hmm. definitely. I think so. Hey. Oh, there is a question. Ah, there is a so, question. So, uh, very interesting. Have you performed some work on how to address casual inference problems with the presented techniques? Yeah. Cas not casual, but. Uh, causal. Causal, I sorry. Causal. causal. That's one that's last step. But no. you see, I think that in the disease mapping context, Causal inference is very difficult to implement. We need to go into that. And there are some words by Patrick Snell and Andrea Papadorgiou and other people. And this is a very hot topic, very, very interesting. But in my, I think, we think that it's very difficult to apply in our disease mapping 
for the time being, we need to think how to how to do that. But I'm sure that it will arrive because casualty is not association. No? Causality is not association. We are going to say something much more profound, that something is causing this problem. We are just saying that something is associated with some. Um, but uh, boof, I think that this is very, very interesting question and very much in the in the real life, let's say, and next topics on research, important. I'm sorry for confounding casual no. and causal. Causal, 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 causal. I'm sorry. So I don't know if there is any other remark or question. Um, I don't think so. Oh, very good. So I think that it's time to thank the speaker again. Muchas okay. gracias. Thank you very much. Muchas Kelly gracias. Um, oh. See you soon. <laughs> I hope so. Right. Thank you. Very okay. Much. Thank you. Thank you.